The Vice Rector of the College of Europe in Natalin, Ms. Eva Oshnetska Tometska, will now give a welcome address. Vice Rector. Thank you. Madam Secretary, Excellencies, Prime Minister, Ministers, Honored Guests, Professors, Dear Students, Ambassador Kozminski, <laughs> it is a great pleasure to launch today our new Natalin Zbigniew Brzeziński Memorial Lecture Series. And it is a particular great honor to have the inaugural lecture delivered by a very special guest, the Honorable Madeleine Albright, former US Secretary of State and the first woman to hold this post in her country. A great stateswoman, defender of democracy, and an ardent proponent of transatlantic cooperation. The public figure who was admired by Zbigniew Brzeziński. Needless to say, he would have been delighted to learn that it is Secretary Albright who is inaugurating the lecture series in his honor, in his memory. What is more, Madam Secretary, you join us today as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the accession to NATO of the Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland, a momentous event that you personally did so much to bring about. We are grateful, we are grateful to your efforts and commitment that so significantly contributed to that historic enlargement of the alliance. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for being with us today. And let me take this opportunity to thank Ambassador Jerzy Kosminski for his continued support in making this memorial series possible. Ladies and gentlemen, as some of us remember firsthand in August 1980, Poland witnessed a wave of workers' protests that began in Gdańsk shipyard and then spread across the country. It was then that the free and independent trade union named Solidarność, Solidarity, was born. This was the beginning of the collapse of the Soviet system of domination in Central and Eastern Europe. But uh, very few could see it at that time. On the 24th of August, 1918, immediately after his return from his summer holidays, Zbigniew Brzeziński went to see US President Carter in his office. He wanted to say clearly what was really going on at that moment in Gdańsk, in Poland, behind the Iron Curtain. Brzeziński explained to the president that the protests were not only about economic demands. Instead, he explained that the protest consists of three elements. The first one was indeed economic and could be best summed up by the word bread. But the second element was political, best described by the word freedom. And the third element was national, embraced by the words independence and cutting. At that crucial time, Professor Zbigniew Brzeziński, a proud American, a Pole by birth, the closest advisor to the President of the United States was able to tell the deep truths about this part of the world. He was able to explain why the Gdańsk strikes had the potential to trigger the collapse of the Soviet Union. History proved him right. Dear guests, part of the power and strength of figures such as Zbigniew Brzeziński and Madeleine Albright in American politics lies in the fact that they did not forget their countries of origin in Europe. They understood them and they were ready to speak out in the free world on behalf of those whose voices were silenced at that time. They gave voice to the voiceless and dignity to those millions locked behind the Iron Curtain and crushed by the Soviet system. 
they were able to say the truth on their behalf, to diagnose the situation correctly, and to pave the way for further action. Madam Secretary, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, Professor Zbigniew Brzeziński was born here in Warsaw on the 28th of March, 1928. His father, Tadeusz Brzeziński, was a Polish diplomat who served in France, Germany, and Soviet Ukraine. Shortly before the Second World War, he took his family to Canada, where he served as the Consul General in Montreal. When the Soviets took control of Poland after the war, Tadeusz Brzeziński decided to leave the Foreign Service and stay in Canada. It was in Montreal where Zbigniew Brzeziński studied political science and economics at McGill University. A brilliant student, he then moved to Harvard where he completed his PhD studies and became a faculty member. From Harvard, he moved to Columbia University in New York, and it was there that I believe you first met him, Madam Secretary, and student, as a student, his graduate student. Dear guests, in the mid-1950s, Professor Brzeziński was the co-author with Karl Friedrich of the definition of totalitarianism, along with other prominent intellectual emigres from Central and Eastern Europe, Zbigniew Brzeziński's goal was to make the world see totalitarianism as a threat. As a threat to peace and a threat to countries, but also as a threat to individual dignity of every human being. This message was to reach the American elites. Through his life, Professor Zbigniew Brzeziński remained a committed academic and celebrated and prolific writer on international relations. His expertise was truly global and went far beyond European affairs, for instance, US-China relation and the Middle East. That is why almost all American presidents from 1960s onwards called on his knowledge and expertise. Zbigniew Brzeziński started with the Kennedy campaign, then worked for President Johnson, then became the national security advisor of President Carter, moving on to advising Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, and most recently, President Obama. His loyalty, loyalty to the United States, as well as his intellectual coherence and the set of his values, meant that he did not restrict himself to one political camp. When service to freedom was at stake, political differences were not an obstacle for him. His aspirations went hand in hand with a unique talent, great intellectual strength, and admirable hard work. Dear students, when we search for inspirations on which path to pursue in our lives, the figure of Brzeziński becomes a model to follow. This is why here at the College of Europe at Natolin, we have decided to establish this lecture series in memory of Zbigniew Brzeziński. Because we, were, we want to send a signal from Natolin that the common values of the Western world are not a worn out cliche. Brzeziński, who in 1990, like few others, voiced support for German reunification and who supported the deepening of European integration and NATO enlargement, was one of the staunchest proponents of the Western values, as well as transatlantic unity. A unity whose guardian on the side of the Atlantic is the United Europe. Dear guests, please allow me to sum up briefly. There are three key reasons why we are meeting here at Natolin today. Three reasons why we are launching the annual Zbigniew Brzeziński Memorial Lecture Series, and doing so at a special time, almost exactly 30 years after the fall of communism. First, Brzeziński was a unique intellectual who was not afraid of responsibility, who did not stand aside, and who got involved in politics for the sake of the common good. The second reason is that, like him, we care deeply 
about Western values and European unity, as well as the transatlantic community. The first reason, maybe the most important, is gratitude. There is so little gratitude in the world. We want to express it towards a man who did so much for our freedom, for the freedom of each and every one of us. I also want to express our sincere gratitude to you, Madam Secretary, for accepting our invitation and for delivering the inaugural lecture. <coughs> because having with us someone who contributed so much to world politics and someone so closely linked to Zbigniew Brzeziński for decades calls for gratitude. Madam Secretary, it is now with immense pleasure that I give you the floor to deliver the first Zbigniew Brzeziński lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Rector, for that very kind introduction and my heartfelt thanks to you and Natalin College of Europe for hosting me here this evening and inviting me to do this. And I'm honored to be here in the presence of so many distinguished guests and friends. Uh, I, uh, a little bit of a Czech accent with my Polish. Uh, I still fondly remember my visit to Natalin three years ago during the NATO summit, and I was deeply impressed by the students that I met and by the college's mission to give a new generation of leaders both an outstanding education and a wider perspective of Europe. That mission is one that very much appealed to Zbigniew Brzezinski, so this beautiful campus, located in the city of his birth, is a most fitting home for a lecture series named in his honor. We would not be here this evening were it not for the efforts of Ambassador Jerzy Koszminski. It's great to see you, and it's uh, not only one of, you have not only been one of Poland's foremost diplomats, but also, I know, one of Zbigniew Brzezinski's very closest friends. And I've so enjoyed spending time with you here, and I so treasure everything that you have done uh, in your incredible career. I know the Brzezinski family is incredibly grateful to Jerzy for working to keep Dr. Brzezinski's legacies shining bright in Poland. The, the timing of this lecture is most appropriate because later this month we will celebrate what would have been Dr. Brzezinski's 91st birthday. And next week in Prague, I will join President Duda and other leaders to commemorate the 20th anniversary of NATO expansion, which Brzezinski supported so strongly. So there's an awful lot for us to discuss this evening. But I'd like to begin with a few observations on the life and legacy of a man who did more than anyone apart from my father to shape my view of the world and my understanding of international relations. Zbigniew Brzezinski was my professor my mentor, my boss, and my friend. And our relationship spanned nearly six decades, and it's hard to believe that he's no longer around to tell me what I'm doing something wrong. Um, I was far from the only one who benefited from his feedback, as demonstrated by the outpouring of testimonials and tributes in the wake of his passing. Brzezinski occupied a unique and towering position in America's foreign policy establishment. Although he served in the administration of President Jimmy Carter, a Democrat, and as you've pointed out, he was greatly respected by Republicans such as Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, who embraced his strong stance against the Soviet Union. Later, his outspoken opposition to the Iraq War would win him admiration among a new generation of American leaders, including U.S. Senator and presidential candidate named Barack Obama. And although they hardly agreed on anything, President Trump sent his national security advisor to Brzezinski's funeral as a sign of respect and appreciation for his service to the United States of America. Brzezinski was a proud, naturalized American citizen, but he loved Poland and understood that he had a special role to play as a voice for Polish freedom and democracy abroad. 
I'll never forget working for him at the Carter White House in the fall of 1980 when new intelligence reports showed the Soviets were going to move troops into Poland to crush the Solidarity Movement. Brzezinski had gotten to know the Pope and appreciated the Holy Father's unique expertise on the Polish situation. The President was meeting with his team in the cabinet room and I was out in the hall. All of a sudden, Brzezinski came out and said, get me the Pope. <laughs> I called the White House operators, who always knew everyone's phone number, and asked for the Pope. They came back quickly and said they didn't have a number for the Pope, perhaps because of the belief in separation of church and state in the United States. Brzezinski became a bit irritated, and when the number was finally located, he said, this can never happen again. Put his number in my personal phone book under P for Pope. <laughs> Throughout his career, Brzezinski faced critics such as Governor Averill Harriman, who argued that his Polish background disqualified him from dealing objectively with the U.S.-Soviet relationship. I often thought, why wouldn't you want someone who actually understood the complicated relationship between Poland and the Soviet Union to give his opinion? Others claim that all he thought about was the struggle with the Soviet Union. They were so wrong. He was prepared to push back against Soviet expansionism, but his horizon was much larger. He saw the world changed by the rise of new regional powers and insisted that attention be paid to them. He led negotiations with China, which culminated in the historic breakthrough of normalization and set the stage for China's modern transformation. He helped President Carter secure the Camp David peace agreement between Egypt and Israel, declare America's opposition to apartheid, and define U.S. interests in the Persian Gulf through the Carter Doctrine. He embraced the idea that support, for <clears throat> that support for democracy and human rights served America's national interest. And by putting human rights squarely on the global agenda, he handed dissidents behind the Iron Curtain a new and effective tool in their struggle. There are many today who overlook this key aspect of his legacy. They lump Brzezinski together with other foreign policy realists who saw little connection between the pursuit of American interests and the fostering of democratic practices. But Brzezinski thought deeply about the role that values have to play in international relations and rejected the false dichotomy between so-called realists and idealists. He would acknowledge that those engaged in statecraft must address the realities of power, yet he also proclaimed, and I quote, that human rights has become the genuine historic inevitability of our times, unquote. I've been thinking an awful lot about that phrase and Brzezinski's defense of democratic ideals in preparing for this visit to Warsaw. But I've also been thinking about a speech I delivered in this city in the year 2000 when I was Secretary of State and attended the first ever meeting of the Community of Democracies. The purpose of my visit then was to talk about how best to sustain democratic progress in the 21st century, and tonight, I would like to revisit that theme in the context of Brzezinski's legacy and the challenges that we and our democratic allies face in this new tumultuous era. To explain my perspective, let me look back to the early 1980s. After the end of the Carter administration, I helped Brzezinski research his memoir, Power and Principle. But having written my dissertation on the role of the Czechoslovak press in Prague spring in 1968, I was also interested in looking at the role of the Polish press in supporting the solidarity movement, which was gaining attention. With Brzezinski's help, I obtained a fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center, which enabled me to travel to Warsaw, Krakow, and Gdansk in November 1981, one month before martial law was imposed. For two weeks, I interviewed journalists, editors, and other pro-democracy troublemakers, including Lech Wałęsa and Bronisław Geremek. In the process, I became not only encouraged, but envious. My plan had been to write about solidarity, but in my heart, I wanted to join solidarity. And even though I was born Czech, I wanted to become a Pole because it was here that history had begun to march. 
Within 10 years, the solidarity movement had triumphed, and that was when history began to gallop. In Hungary, freedom emerged after 10 months, in East Germany, 10 weeks, in Czechoslovakia, 10 days, and in Romania, 10 hours. After decades of darkness, the entire continent was flooded with light. When I returned to government in the 1990s, <clears throat> I had a chance <clears throat> to make the most out of that opportunity. Our, go <clears throat> our goal was to bring nations together based on core principles of democracy and free enterprise, human rights, and the rule of law. To that end, we took bold strides towards the creation of a Europe whole and free. We worked to strengthen NATO by accepting new and broader responsibilities and by adding new members. Among those who offered essential support for this idea was Zbigniew Brzezinski, who worked closely with then Ambassador of the United States, Jerzy Skominski, to make the case for NATO enlargement. The role that they played in making Poland's admission to NATO possible cannot be overstated. At a time when many eminent American strategists, including George Kennan, Paul Nitze, and Robert McNamara, were publicly arguing against expansion, Brzezinski launched his own intellectual campaign, writing articles and opinion pieces, testifying before the Senate, and giving dozens of media interviews. His efforts had a decisive impact, convincing bipartisan majorities that America and Europe would be stronger when a NATO that included Central Europe's new democracies. One of my proudest moments came on March 12, 1999, when I was able to call Brzezinski from the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, to tell him that Poland had just been formally admitted to the alliance. It was tempting during that miraculous time to believe that democracy was in command and that the world would continue to move towards a more cooperative international system. In the span of just a few decades, we had seen nation after nation gain its freedom in Central and Eastern Europe, from communism in Asia and Africa, from colonialism in Latin America, from military dictators in South Africa, from apartheid. We witnessed and celebrated all of this, but also saw warning signs that the democratic tide could recede. Because while democracy in the long run is the most stable form of government, in the short run, it is among the most fragile. In the 1990s, new democracies began their existence with vast inherited problems, including centrally planned economies, large debts, and small bank accounts, ethnic strife, and a lack of democratic institutions. This complicated many countries' ability to combat corruption and crime and to, bring, and to build a strong civil society. In addition, some countries were burdened with leaders who were more interested in self-promotion and self-enrichment than self-government. So although economic growth was often impressive, democracy's promise didn't necessarily translate into the coin of higher living standards for the average person. And the onset of democracy did not increase public satisfaction with the institutions of government. All of this was on my mind when I traveled to Poland in 2000 for the Community of Democracies meeting. The idea behind the event was that free countries should help one another by sharing knowledge, providing assistance, and treating a threat to one as a danger to all. Officials from more than 100 countries participated. The host city was Warsaw, because Bronislaw Goremek, who was by then Poland's foreign minister, wanted this city to be known for something other than the Warsaw Pact. In my remarks, I acknowledged the anxieties facing many democracies and warned that if they were not addressed, public confidence would erode, and support would grow for failed remedies from the past, including extreme nationalism and authoritarianism. Regrettably, it now appears this warning was prescient. Because in the short history of this century, we have witnessed a multiplication of international divisions, a backlash against globalization, a resurgence of extreme nationalism, and a worldwide retreat from democratic values. In the wake of the global financial crisis, China's vision of economic gains, unaccompanied by democratic norms, has gained appeal. 
Russia's active measures campaign has succeeded in deepening social divisions, sowing further doubts about democracy and undermining confidence in Western institutions. We also see more and more countries employing squads of opinion shapers to flood online sites and social media networks where one can spread lies just as easily as truth. I have spent a lot of time in recent years thinking and writing about why freedom has seemingly gone into retreat, and the person whose perspective I especially valued was Zbigniew Brzezinski's. At a time when many were proclaiming that the fall of the Berlin Wall had brought about the end of history, Brzezinski understood that the triumph of liberal democracy was not assured. He wrote a book in 1993 called Out of Control, which made a series of dark predictions about the future. It feels especially relevant today because he warned that xenophobia, ethnic hatreds, religion, and grievance over the loss of status could give rise to a new form of fascism in Russia. Fascism, he wrote, is particularly effective in exploiting the irrational side of human nature, appealing quite effectively to emotions that can be galvanized through nationalistic symbols, exploiting the attraction of national power and glory, and responding to the craving for discipline and uniformity." Unquote. Brzezinski warned that if such a desire for order took root, it would not be confined to Russia, but would almost certainly spread across Europe. He took no pleasure in being proven right. Towards the end of his life, he saw that the entire continent was wrestling with questions of identity, ethnic and religious pluralism, migration, and the consequences of modern technology. He also saw that Central Europe had once again become a place of testing for democratic values and institutions. During the Cold War, communist leaders sought to hijack the term by calling their system people's democracy or guided democracy. So Brzezinski and I watched with some sense of irony as a former Hungarian dissident, Viktor Orban, emerged as a champion of illiberal democracy, which is indeed an oxymoron. <laughs> Far from embracing democracy, Orban has looked to Russia and Turkey as models for how to stifle a free press, eliminate an independent judiciary, and distort the electoral system so that his party is all but ensured to win elections. History teaches us that fascism and the tendencies that lead to it are subject to imitation. So it worries me when I hear leaders speak of bringing Orban's model of illiberal democracy to Poland or building coalitions that seek to undermine the unity of European institutions and warning of refugees spreading disease and parasites. And it concerns me that nearly every country on the continent there are political parties echoing the same basic themes, less migration, less tolerance towards minority, less identification with Europe, and more interest in going their own way. But what troubles me the most, and I know it troubles Zbigniew Brzezinski, to see the United States playing a different role now than it has in the past. Instead of seeking to unify the democratic community as we did in Warsaw in 2000, we have an American president who dismisses the ideas of working cooperatively with our Western allies, whose own actions and rhetoric are often at odds with democratic ideals. We have a tradition in America that when traveling abroad, citizens, especially former secretaries of state, should not engage in blunt criticism of our president, nor interfere in the politics of their host country. Uh, as a former secretary of state, I will abide by that tradition, but I will tonight emphasize what I am for and what I believe Zbigniew Brzezinski stood for, and then you can draw your own conclusions. To begin, I believe the world needs leaders who will bring people together instead of driving them apart. I believe in a free press dedicated to the pursuit of truth in all its aspects and a government that protects the rights of journalists because the truth can never be an enemy to an honest leader. I also believe that democratic leaders should help and support one another instead of reserving their warmest words for dictators and the world's leading abusers of personal dignity and human rights. 
I believe in multilateral cooperation to address global problems, including climate change, nuclear nonproliferation, terrorism, Middle East peace, and a free and fair and open system of trade. I believe the logic underpinning the European Union remains utterly compelling, even as I recognize that for those working on a farm in Poland or a factory in Bratislava, allegiance to Brussels does not come naturally, if at all. Finally, I believe in the ongoing value of a transatlantic partnership. As children, Zbigniew Brzezinski and I saw what happens when good and decent people fail to unite in the face of demagogues. In that era, Poland was among the countries that paid a terrible price. So we cannot afford to be complacent. We must draw a line between legitimate debate and efforts to augment power by chipping away at the foundations of democracy. We have to recognize that the alliance between Poland and the United States is one based not only on shared interests, but on shared values. If our countries move away from those values, then it undermines the strength of our bond. In the United States, we have a slogan that has been drilled into us in relation to the fight against terror. If we see something, such as unattended suitcase or a backpack, we should say something. Well, when I look around the world today, I am disturbed by much of what I see. So I've added a third element to the slogan, see something, say something, and what I've added is do something. And that is why I wrote my most recent book as a warning. And that is why I'm calling on people on both sides of the Atlantic to stand together and vow that we will not allow would-be dictators and despots to shape our future. Last month, I was proud to travel to the Munich Security Conference to launch a new initiative aimed at rallying the democratic world on behalf of common values. Spearheaded by the Atlantic Council and America's former ambassador to Poland, Dan Fried, the centerpiece of this effort is a new Declaration of Principles for Freedom, Security, and Prosperity, which was co-signed by the leaders from every region of the world and across the political spectrum. More than 70 years have elapsed since the Atlantic Charter was issued and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. It has been almost 30 years since the rebirth of freedom in Central and Eastern Europe, and has been almost 20 years since the community of democracies gathered to sign the Warsaw Declaration. Perhaps we all started taking some of these principles for granted. So the time is right to renew our vows and to engage a new generation in freedom's cause. In the months ahead, we will be working with universities and parliaments and civil society to gain support for these principles and to revitalize the institutions that underpin them. I am keenly aware that for the leaders of today and tomorrow, the experiences that shaped my worldview and that of Zbigniew Brzezinski may seem like ancient history. A generation whose worldview was shaped by World War II and the Cold War is passing from the stage. We cannot prepare for the future by clinging to the past, but I pray that we do not have to endure another trauma on the scale of World War II to recognize the urgency of civic responsibility, international cooperation, and the rule of law. To avoid that fate, we need to learn from experience and recognize the threat posed when governments become hostile or indifferent to the ideals that defeated fascism and brought down the Berlin Wall. It's been almost two years since we said goodbye to Zbig, and I miss talking to him and arguing with him. But today's event, and so many others like it that have taken place, help reassure me that his legacy will endure. Zbig always understood that he had an obligation to pass on his wisdom to new generations. I was lucky enough to have benefited from his willingness to be a mentor, and I know that many in this audience did as well. It is incumbent on all of us to carry forward that tradition. And that is why I'm proud to chair the National Democratic Institute, which helps train young activists around the world to assemble the nuts and bolts of democracy. And that's why I make my students read this, his latest book, his last book, Strategic Vision, and why I recently dusted off my copy of the Soviet bloc, which is more relevant than ever. And it is why I enjoy spending time at universities such as Natalin College. And it's always 
why I think it's important to teach the lessons that we can draw from Spig's life. Aggressors must be resisted. Hate can never again be allowed to hide behind the mask of nationalist pride. And America and Poland have a special responsibility to uphold and defend democracy. Spigniew Brzezinski learned too much in life to expect perfection, but he cared too much to settle for a world as it is. He was a realistic optimist who never stopped being an idealist. He understood well that democratic elections do not always produce good leaders or efficient governments, but he recognized that the advantage of living in a democracy is that you do not have to prevail in every debate or win every election in order to have your voice heard and your rights protected. The rule of law ensures that with majority rule come minority rights. Moreover, democracy carries within it the remedies of its own shortcomings. Through its processes, policies may be changed, division bridged, and leaders held accountable. Democracy is fragile, but it is also resilient. It is not the answer to every human problem, but it is the best system of government humans have devised, and the only system that values and respects the rights of all. And that is why so many brave men and women have sacrificed their lives and pledged their honor in freedom's name. And that is why the best way to honor the life and legacy of Zbigniew Brzezinski is to continue the struggle to defend and strengthen democracy in Europe, America, and around the world.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Jakub Matuszczyk, and he was playing Ignacy Jan Paderewski's minuet in G major, uh, the first prime minister of uh, free Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now very lucky because Madam Secretary Albright has very kindly offered to take part in a question and answer and debate session. And this will be moderated by Michał Kobolsko, who is the uh, special advisor and country representative in Poland at the Atlantic Council. Michał. Madam Secretary, it's such a, such a great pleasure and honor to have you here today with us at Natalin College. Uh, as you saw, the reaction to your speech was very different from the reaction to the speech of Vice President Pence in Munich <laughs> recently, <laughs> as some of you had noticed. Uh, I must say I admire the US tradition which you mentioned of um, avoiding to criticize a president while traveling abroad. Um, we admire this. Uh, however, I, I would like to ask you what would Dr. Brzezinski say about the changing role and position of the US in today's world about dealing with such issues as uh, China, North Korea, Venezuela, to mention just, just a couple. What would Dr. Brzezinski say today? I love the idea that I get to speak for the dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it gives me an opportunity to uh, kind of channel Dr. Brzezinski. Um, I do believe that he understood the important role of the United States as a leader in terms of values and understanding the responsibility and power that the world's oldest democracy has and the kinds of respect that the United States, I think, gained through a series of presidents of both parties in the period since the uh, end of the World War II and then later. So I think he would be deeply troubled because he understood the responsibilities. And I think that um, just going around the world, um, maybe we should begin with Asia because he really did um, open up China. Dr. Kissinger was the first one to visit, and then um, Zbig was the one that was able to really bring normalization and understood it. And I think that in terms of the whole issue on North Korea, he would be very worried about the entanglement um, that President Trump has kind of developed with somebody that is a dictator um, who doesn't tell the truth. So I think that worried about that. I also just generally think that he was very interested in the role of regional influentials, and he would be troubled by the things that were happening in the Middle East with Iran, obviously, and then obviously the kinds of things in Latin America with Venezuela that was viewed as a potential regional influential that now has been uh, chastised by the region's powers, uh, the Lima Group, as well as Europeans. So I could go on, but generally a little bit uh, the title of that book, Out of Control, um, and that the US is not playing the role that it should be, a leadership role uh, and a responsible one where we work with our partners to help solve some of those problems. Talking about your partners, US partners, I want to be a bit more specific asking you about the tensions, we should call them tensions, between the uh, United States and the European Union. Um, because, um, well, th the question would be whether this is just President Trump or this is the European Union as well, trying to change the reposition its, um, its place in the, in the globalized world. So is it, is it just President Trump changing the course of the United States or do we have also a problem on the other side of the Atlantic? Um, let me kind of put that into a larger context because I do think that one of the issues that is out there now in the 21st century um, is which organizations work in an entirely new setting. Uh, and 
I have said a number of times that people, as well as organizations around age 70, need a little refurbishing. Um, and, and I have to say that, um, and this may surprise you and others, but um, when I was in office and I dealt with a lot of different groups, I found the European Union the most irritating. Um, and so <clears throat> what I would do is say, I was born in Europe, I'm exactly like you, except I was raised in the United States, so let me tell you what I think you're doing wrong. Uh, <clears throat> and when I was at the United Nations and I would go to a European ambassador and ask for help on a vote, the ambassador would say, I'm so sorry I can't help you because the EU does not yet have a common position. And then I'd go back to the same ambassador a couple of days later and say, can you help me now? And the ambassador would say, no, because we do have a common position. <laughs> uh, so before Brexit, I even thought that it might be useful for the European Union to have the permanent seat, which of course would have made the British and French crazy. But, but I do think that there are problems on both sides. And I think that the European Union uh, does need to sort out what its role is. I find what President Macron is saying very interesting. Uh, one of my colleagues, Joschka Fischer, um, has also spent time talking about what could be done with the European Union. But I think that we need to, uh, both sides need to think about it because the Euro-Atlantic relationship continues to be, I think, an absolutely crucial one. And our partnership is very important in terms of trying to deal with some of the issues that you already were raised are out there. And what has been interesting on the Venezuela issue, it has, in fact, Europeans have been critical of what happened, along with the Lima Group, which really did, in fact, I think, add strength to the argument if we operate together. Then we have uh, Russia and our dear friend, President Putin. Uh, I want to ask you about, uh, well, that, that's going to be a pretty controversial. There are some experts who say that America should eventually seek to team up with Russia because there's another bigger issue worldwide, and the issue is China. So therefore, United States is in a need to find a kind of a compromise with President Putin and to, in a way, join forces with, with Russia. What, what, how do you comment to that? Well, I do think that the biggest problem out there is a rising China. I think that that is true. The part of the reason that China is rising is because it has opportunities, but also because the United States has created a vacuum by not being there. And to all of a sudden see China as the supporter of um, climate change and the Paris Agreement is a little weird for me. Um, and also in terms of their um, approach to a number of issues that I would think the US might want to take a lead on. I think that, um, frankly, we're a little bit late on what you're suggesting because the Chinese and Russians have decided that they like each other again. Uh, and so I, I do not see us doing that. I do think that we need to figure out how to have a functional relationship with Russia, that uh, we don't have to be um, at sword's point on everything, but at the moment we are in bad shape. And what I think is that Putin, who is a KGB agent, has figured out how to play a weak hand brilliantly, and I think that we have played a strong hand poorly. Thank you, thank you for this answer. Uh, you were testifying to the House Foreign Affairs Committee last week, or a, w a week ago or so, and you were kind of announcing your trip to Poland and Czech Republic, and you said that your fellow Czechs, they are, um, they like the idea of treating you as both as a queen and a kind of an irritating older sister. Yes. That's, that's so in that Prague. Is so, that is so, absolutely. In Prague. I am now an irritating older sister more often than a queen. <laughs> so what, what, what is the message of the irritating older sister to, the, to, the, to this region? Because what you also said uh, while, while talking to the, to the house uh, a week ago was that you are worried uh, worried about the growing distance between the Eastern Europe and the Western Europe. Uh, so my question is, aren't you exaggerating that, uh, that we have a situation of a bad Eastern Europe and good Western Europe? Well, I think that 
Um, we do have an issue, as I already mentioned, with Europe um, generally and how the US and the European Union get, get along. I do not see, I personally, uh, I'm not liking the fact that there are those who criticize Eastern Europe and don't criticize Western Europe. I don't think it's fair. Uh, I think that the Eastern Europeans uh, had an awful lot that they had to get over. Uh, and I have admired the work that has taken place um, by Poland way before anybody else took the steps. But I am troubled by the following aspects, which is that uh, I think that there has not been enough emphasis on um, the democratic parts of the NATO. Uh, you know, when we took the, the new countries, when the first enlargement of NATO, I stressed when I came here, as did General Shali Kashvili when we first started with the Partnership for Peace, that NATO is not just a military alliance, it is an alliance of democracies. And so I have been troubled by some of the steps back in terms of the political changes that have been taking place in Central and Eastern Europe. I am willing to admit that I was part of the post-wall uh, falling euphoria. Uh, and I, I really thought that um, all the countries, but especially the three that we took into NATO had first, had the capabilities and the desire and the hope to really be a part of a democratic Europe that was whole and free and partners with the United States. I have been I'm very clear about my disappointment with Hungary uh, in a very clear way. I have stated some of my um, uh, problems with the things that are happening in Poland, and I have problems with some of the things that are happening in the Czech Republic, because I think that we do want to see an evol democracy, as I said, is not easy, but we really need to see steps forward and not steps backward, and I think some attraction to more um, authoritarian ways of doing business, I think, is not the way that I would like to see uh, any country go towards. And I, in my book, I haven't just written about Central and Eastern Europe. I've written about what troubles me about Turkey and the Philippines and Venezuela uh, and various other aspects where democracy is being pushed aside for order. I think that that is not a good idea. Talking about the NATO and the military presence, we, we have uh, the ongoing discussion about the military presence of the United States in Europe, in Central Europe. Do you, do you share the view that the United States should be much more visible and active, engaged and present uh, here in Poland, Baltic states and the region, military? Well, let me say what is interesting. Um, I have uh, spent a lot of time looking at NATO um, and, and feel as somebody who was born um, in Czechoslovakia that it wasn't until the Czechoslovak coup in February 48 that the United States started to pay more attention to Central and Eastern Europe again. And so NATO was born. What is interesting is that NATO, um, when we were in office, was the first time it went to war in the Balkans, and I think really did make a difference, and uh, working with the NATO system was very important at that time. Uh, I also do think that what was interesting at the 60th anniversary of NATO, um, the heads of state met in Strasbourg, Kiel. Rasmussen was named as Secretary General. And one of the decisions was by the heads of state that he would have a group of experts um, advise him on that. And every country named an expert. I was named for the United States. Adam Daniel Rothfeld was. We uh, got to know each other then. Um, and then what happened, Rasmussen decided that he only wanted 12 countries to be on the group of experts, automatically irritating 16 countries. And then he asked me to chair it. What was interesting was the amount of time we spent on out of area activities that, the, that NATO was going to do. Uh, in, and what the lessons were out of the Balkans and Afghanistan. We talked about the fact that NATO had more partners than it had members. We talked about whether a cyber attack was an Article 5 attack. Very different subjects, and all of a sudden, what the Russians did in Georgia and Ukraine 
made us think again about in area. So I think it is appropriate, given what I see as threats from Russia uh, and the undermining of democracy, for in fact to have some of those troops be in the region. And then also, frankly, the kinds of things that are going on in the Arctic um, Ocean, some of the issues with Nord Stream. I think there are any number of reasons where all of a sudden we're back in area. I'm not going to discuss how many American troops should be where. They, that needs to be done on the basis of military decisions and not ego. Madam Secretary, thank you for answering the first questions. Um, let me now open the floor to the, to the questions on your side. Uh, just, just one notion that we have decided to slightly reduce or limit the freedom of expression by letting the first question to be raised by a student, yep. a student of Natalin College. So perhaps you would be the person. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and be brief. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Yasmin, and I come from Algeria. Um, so I have two questions, if it is possible. Um, so my first question is, um, as a history maker, witness, and insider of history, to what extent did the concept of democracy has shifted since the time of the post-Soviet word that Mr. Brzezinski and yourself proactively witnessed? Especially when, as today, as you just mentioned, democracy is often confiscated for order. Um, and my second question is uh, about your book, um, Fascism, uh, a warning. You clearly point out the danger and threat of fascism that arises again on the heartlands of democracy. So in the context of today's Europe actuality and events, including, as you mentioned, uh, United States that plays a role that is a paradox to the values that it, plays, that, it, that it pushed before, what are your predictions for the EU and the US role in protecting and promoting the values of democracy and continuing the legacy of Mr. Brzezinski? Thank you. Thank you. You do know I'm a professor, so it will take me 50 minutes to answer. <laughs> Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so these were the questions for today. Yeah. Yeah. No, but let me answer um, really the first one, and then we'll deal with the other one uh, along this. What I find interesting is that many of us, and I say this as somebody that has been a part of the National Democratic Institute since its founding, thought that technology would be a democratizing concept, that it would give people an opportunity to really play a role. I think it has turned out to be a complication in many different ways. And I take Egypt as the example of what happened. People were summoned to Tahrir Square by social media. Uh, and they had all had kind of their uh, echo chamber of where they got their information. They end up at Tahrir Square. And so how do you get from Tahrir Square to governance? So what happened, and it's strange that I should say this, but the elections were held too soon. And the Muslim Brotherhood was organized, and the people in Tahrir Square had gotten there individually, and there, were no, there was not a political party of any kind. So the Muslim Brotherhood wins. And there, is all, there are all kinds of things that keep happening, and uh, journalists are arrested in a number of different aspects. And the mess in Tahrir Square continues. So what happens is I made up this uh, older guy who wants to come into uh, Cairo to open his stall in the marketplace. And Cairo's a mess, and he says, to hell with this in Arabic. And so all of a sudden, he says, I want order. And now you have a military government um, in Egypt. And I think that that is part of the problem, is how do you time things? What are the nuts and bolts of the democracy? How does technology fit into it? Uh, how does it not uh, disaggregate people rather than aggregate them in some kind of groupings um, in order to be able to run countries? So there are those problems with it. And so I think we need to think about how democracy deals with technology um, and how, in fact, um, democracy does take a while. The other part that I'd, I'm sure that you're studying these kinds of things, what comes first, political development or economic development? You are, are, one argues in class. They come together because democracy has to deliver because people want to vote and eat. And so I think there are questions about how both are provided. So. Thank you. Next question, please. Gentleman there. 
Good evening. Um, I am Manfredi Mineo. I come from Italy. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do a research, um, a question and answer session. It's very important for our students. So my question will be brief. Uh, at the end of March, uh, it seems that Italy will adhere to the Belt and Road Initiative, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Some uh, US analysts say that this initiative is actually made by the Chinese for the Chinese, and that in the long run, Europe will never benefit from, from such initiative. What is your opinion on that? Well, I am, um, I have to say, worried about the Belt and Road Initiative, because one of the reasons it was thought up by the Chinese is because they're resource hungry. Uh, and they do have issues in terms of oil and a number of other resources. I have um, been uh, in many countries in Africa, for instance, or in Kenya, they were talking about building a road through the Serengeti, and the American contractors had a bunch of environmental regulations, and the Chinese came and said, where do you want it? Um, and they bring their own workers in, and there are a number of issues, plus there is the so-called debt trap. Um, that they set up uh, ways of, of linking the countries that they have lent money to to pay them back. I have said the Chinese must be getting very fat because the belt keeps getting larger and larger. Um, and they are in many places. And I think that um, there, there are probably ways that certain countries can benefit from the Chinese uh, uh, help. But I do think, for the most part, it is about the way of Chinese spreading um, their influence and filling a vacuum that the United States has left. Let me add to, to, to this question about the Chinese involvement. Do you believe the threat associated with a Chinese company with H letter, starting with H letter, yeah. is it a serious threat from, from your perspective or is, is it again an exaggeration in some countries starting from the US? Well, I think the question really is, uh, that we become, we, all of us, very dependent on Chinese component parts uh, through Huawei. And I think that it is something that we should be looking at together. Um, I think that there are various parts of it that seem kind of hysterical at the moment. But I do think that there are issues about Chinese um, whole aspect on intellectual property, on some of the things that they're doing. Um, it is my understanding that the component parts really are a problem and that we then become dependent on them. I do think there's also the question that there are those Western companies that feel that there's competition, so that there are a number of aspects. I wish we would deal with, on, with this issue together. I also do think that, and this goes a little bit to the previous question, in terms of what is generally happening in terms of technology, wherever it comes from, of being part of hacking and cybersecurity and um, uh, you know, planting bugs and various things, that it's something that our institutional structures have not figured out how to deal with well. That is one of the issues out there that needs to be dealt with with more um, uh, cooperation among uh, on the multinational countries. level I think on the multinational do, do level. we need another body international organization no, but to deal I do think it's important to kind of develop the rules of the road for the internet and for a number of different ways that we thought technology as I mentioned earlier would be just a blessing where there are a number of things that there need to be some kind of rules and I do think it does need an international uh, way, uh, you know, maybe some taking some lessons from arms control agreements or different ways that uh, the, multi the multilateral world has to deal with it. Thank you. Yes, the lady there. Here. My name is Gerta, I'm from Albania, and it is an honor being here with you today. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about the U.S.-German relations, which are very important in transatlantic affairs. Uh, do you believe that the American-German relations are experiencing a similar uh, crisis like the 2002 between President Bush and Chancellor Schroeder? Thank you. Well, I think they... Um, you mentioned the Munich Security Conference. Um, I would say yes, uh, that there really is a difference at this point in terms of the way that we look at things. 
Uh, I am hoping that uh, U.S.-German relations will be on a level where we see each other as partners in trying to deal with one of the most complicated issues in uh, our world, that we, which is what these questions are all about. What do we have in common? How do we work together? Um, whether it's through NATO or the European Union or bilaterally. Um, but I think that at the moment, um, just from observing, things seem a little bit tense. Thank you. Gentleman here. Yes. Madam Secretary, thank you. Yeah. My name is Bacho, and I had an honor to get to know you two years ago during your visit to Georgia. I'm interested, what is the biggest legacy of the biggest achievement of Clinton administration today? Thank you. Well, um, I actually do think NATO expansion is. Um, I know there are those who think it was a mistake. I totally disagree. Um, and I think that all one has to do is ask the new members uh, what would they prefer? Um, and so I, I think that is an achievement. I think also, you know, I hate to, when I teach at Georgetown now and I talk about the Clinton administration, it's a little bit like teaching about Napoleon or something. Uh, for me, it is very vivid and for them, they weren't born. So trying to explain what the world was like at that point and trying to use the international organizations and developing uh, how the UN might be able to operate through the peacekeeping operations and then trying to see, by the way, um, President Clinton said it first that we were the indispensable nation. I just said it so often. It became identified with me. There's nothing about the word indispensable, however, that says alone. It means in partnership, and President Clinton believed in partnerships, and we operated that way. Um, I have to say that personally, um, I think that what we did in the Balkans was the right thing to do. Um, the problem with Americans is that we are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span. So some of these issues don't get resolved. Um, and I think we pass from one administration to another and certain things are not picked up. And I think we need to figure out how to do that. But I was very proud to serve in the Clinton administration. And I think that we really, President Clinton kept trying to build bridges to the 21st century because he knew that it was going to be a different kind of a system. Um, and then obviously it was changed in many ways as a result. Uh, of the war in Iraq, but I do think that I'm very proud of the things we did to see ourselves internationally. Americans also don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism, <laughs> but other than that, it's partnership. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the lady here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jana Hohmann. I come from Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Would you agree with the statement that the rise of fascism, about which you write in your book, is a side effect of globalization? Thank you. Well, it's interesting because one of the things that I have been saying is that there are two mega trends out there that have their downside. And we've touched on this a little bit, but globalization is clearly a mega trend that most of us have benefited from. But it's faceless. Um, the bureaucrats in Brussels, we talked, are faceless. And so what has happened is that people want, and I, the downside is it's facelessness, and people want to have an identity, which is a very important thing to know your ethnic, religious, linguistic background. Um, and that can be very patriotic. But if my identity hates your identity, then it becomes nationalism, and hypernationalism is very dangerous. And I think that the hypernationalism is one of the warning signs of authoritarian government, which could lead to fascism. And so I point that out. Technology also, in many ways, has its downside, which I already mentioned in terms of um, the um, the rapidity of social media to spread um, various uh, untruths very quickly or separate people. I always, I do believe in my to-do list is that one has to listen to people and have discussions with people one disagrees with. You should all be very glad you don't live in Washington because I listen to right-wing radio as I drive and I get fairly excited and someday I will be arrested. But I do think it is important to listen to people that you disagree 
disagree with. And so technology and the social media also has its downside. And then the fact that it disarticulates people so that they don't create, uh, I believe, in political parties. And so it, uh, it has undermined that aspect, too. Thank you. More question. Yes, in the back, gentlemen. In the back. Uh, good evening. Um, my question is about uh, membership in NATO. This year we uh, celebrate 20th could, anniversary. Could you speak a, a bit louder? Uh, yeah, uh, we are celebrating 20th anniversary in uh, NATO. And my question is about uh, just many, many, many things to do to become a strong, a strong member of the NATO. And is it about technicalians or about values? And the next question is: Do you agree with the statement that uh, joining the NATO was the Biggest, the, the most, it was the biggest success for Polish national defense. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the first part of the question, values. Values. I think it's a very important part of NATO. I really do think, and part of the thing that I think has been forgotten, or not as much attention has been paid to it, uh, as in fact the the value system of NATO, and um, and I thought I might be asked this question. So the bottom line is the preamble to the North Atlantic Treaty says, the parties to this treaty reaffirm their faith in the purposes and principles of the Charter of the UN and the desire to live in peace. They are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. So that that is the basis of it, and not just, um, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about 2%. Uh, the members of NATO should be 100% for democracy and values. I think that is something that we seem to forget. Um, and so I, I think that we need to stress that. I do think that uh, I personally was very much for Poland being a member of NATO. I think it has, in fact, benefited uh, in terms of its position, both uh, on, on defense issues. There's no question. Um, I would like to see more in the values part. Thank you. More questions uh, here, gentlemen. Georg Bagdasarian from Armenia. First of all, I would like to thank you for this interesting lecture. We are so grateful. Uh, my first, uh, my question is the following. What is your opinion on the suspension for, of uh, inter intermediate rank nuclear force treaty? Well, I think that um, it is, um, I think, a, a very bad mistake to have pulled out of it. Let me just say, though, that there's no question uh, that the Russians had violations of the treaty. And it was something that was being discussed in the previous administration um, by the Obama people about it. Um, I think the Russians thought we were violating it. Um, and I think that mostly the arms control agreements that have been created uh, across the years have a method for dealing with these kinds of issues. Um, and so I think that what happened when the U.S. Uh, declares its uh, decision to pull out. It gave the Russians an excuse to do that um, and has undermined one of the basic aspects. Um, and it was very hard to get the INF Treaty in the first place. I think what is very interesting is that uh, President Reagan and Gorbachev are the ones that finally came to that agreement. And it saved Europe from um, a period of having missiles and uh, a very dangerous kind of aspect of it. And so the question is, what next? Because um, I think it might be good to multilateralize it a little bit more and see whether the Chinese shouldn't be a part of it. Uh, and then it also gives a signal that makes me nervous about the fact that the new Star Treaty, which expires in a couple of years, that not enough discussion has even come of that. The Russians, Putin has given a speech in which he's talking about modernizing their nuclear uh, arsenal. Um, there has been some discussion of that in the United States also. And I think we need, ar we need arms control agreements. And they're not perfect, but they provide a mechanism for dealing when there are um, assessments of violations. So I think it was a mistake to pull out of it. Thank you. Uh, shall I activate first rows as well? Yep. Do you have questions from that part of the room? Yes. 
the lady in red, please. Yes. Good evening, Madam Secretary. I uh, I am the director of the Central European branch of the American Jewish Committee here in Warsaw. And if I can use this opportunity to give uh, David Harris best to you, I know you, you two Good met friend. in Munich. Um, if you could share with us a little bit your perspective on, uh, on Iran. Uh, and how you see the role of Iran uh, in the Middle East and also in the context of JCPOA um, and about the GC JCPOA in the context of the transatlantic uh, alliance right. and the obvious break um, that it is causing in this relationship. Yes. Thank um, you. Let me say you have, are part of the Atlantic Council family. Um, one of the things that happened, and I teased the uh, Fred Kemp, who's the president of the Atlantic Council, that he had become an imperialist when he asked Steve Hadley and me to do a project on the Middle East. And I said, actually, the Middle East is not on the Atlantic. Um, but we did do a project on it. And I think that what is so clear are the historical aspects of the region. By the way, I worked for a president who read a lot. Um, and he assigned us books. And so one book that President Clinton assigned to me was the, called The Peace to End All Peace, which is what did the Middle East look like after the end of World War I with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The short version of the book is that the modern Middle East was created by the British and French bureaucracies lying to each other. And we are dealing with a lot of the aspects of that still. And, but what is clear is the competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that it is not just the, sh most Americans didn't know anything about Islam, much less the difference between Shia and Sunni. So there is that, plus then the Arabs versus the Persians. And I think the, that Iran is dangerous, there's no question. Among the various years that end in nines, uh, we also have to, this is an anniversary of the hostage crisis, which changed America's relationship with Iran. And by the way, Spig on this was very interesting, because he had thought that Iran was one of the um, new influentials. Uh, the President Carter and the Shah had in fact spent time together, any number of different aspects. And the hostage crisis paralyzed everything. And our relationship with Iran has never been the same. I think Iran is a threat. I think their nuclear potential is a threat, which is why I think the JCPOA was worth doing. Um, and I think it was a mistake to pull out of it. It was a multilateral, it's a, it was an agreement, frankly, not a treaty, mainly because people were worried about getting advice and consent from the Senate, but it was worth doing. And it has given, um, it's difficult for the other members of the P5 plus one uh, in order what to do and some to do with the business relationships. And it has given an excuse to the hardliners in Iran, the, the guard, for not abiding by things. And so I think it was a big mistake to pull out, but Iran is, a, not a, uh, uh, an agent of good in the Middle East. There's no question in terms of their support for Hezbollah and various other things they've done, whatever effect they're now going to have in Syria. So I'm worried about Iran, but we have given them an excuse. And I think pulling out was a mistake. Thank you. Question here. Yes. My name is Jacek Stawiski. We spoke uh, a few moments before your lecture. About Middle East, you have uh, witnessed the collapse of the uh, Camp David summit of 2000 between Barak and Arafat, and Clinton administrations have heavy, has heavily invested in Middle East peace. We are 20, almost 20 years after this Camp David collapse, and the Middle East, in terms of relations between Israel and the Palestinians looks completely different. How, how would you describe the possibilities of Trump administration uh, solving the Middle East peace process? Well, let me say, I, I'm sometimes asked about the Middle East and, and the Camp David that we did, and I often say to the audience, if I were to invite you to Camp David, you'd probably say you'd like to come. I can tell you after two weeks in the rain with the Israelis and Palestinians, I don't care if I ever go back. Um, and partially the issue, and I think this is worth thinking about, um, uh, Ehud Barak made some very generous ideas towards the end of the thing in terms of how Jerusalem should look and the holy places. We had agreed that uh, we would not 
talk to the so-called moderate Arabs about it. And it was a mistake because, in fact, um, Arafat and the Palestinians do not control the disposition of the holy places. It is done by the Saudis and, to some extent, the Tunisians. And when we called them, they had no idea what we were talking about. So I think we were asking something of Arafat that, one, he was not legally able to do, but psychologically was not able to do. He saw himself as a PLO fighter, um, and he had great, uh, he was well received everywhere, which was much better than worrying about the sewer system in Gaza. So it was, there are many aspects of it. I do think that what has happened now uh, with the fact that funding has been cut off to a lot of Palestinian organizations, by the United States and the United Nations, it has undermined our capability of being an honest broker. So I don't know how this is going to be done. I do think, I happen to believe in, a, in the two-state solution, um, and, you know, I, I think it's, I, I'm not very hopeful about something coming out of this at the moment because you need to talk to the Palestinians about it, um, or whoever does this, and that there may be some channel open that I don't know about, but at the moment I don't think it looks very, I'm not very optimistic about it. Um. Thank you. We have time for two more questions, so gentlemen here first. Uh, good evening, Honorable Secretary of State. Uh, my name is Osama and I'm from Morocco. Uh, so my question is the following. How do you evaluate the U.S. position over the brutal murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul, as well as the other uh, human rights violations happening in Saudi Arabia? And how do you explain the, the American reluctance from taking a strong position over Saudi Arabia despite all of the events, evidences that say that there was a direct intervention of the Crown Prince in this, in this crime. Don't you think that the, Saudi, the Saudi's money is getting a more influential role on the American foreign policy nowadays? Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say I, I just was in Marrakesh in December. Um, and one of the points that became very clear to me there, if I may say this, is I was invited to the UN conference on migration at the time. And what happened was it was being um, Louise Arbor, a Canadian, was running it. And she invited me to speak. And what really upset me terribly was the US was absent. The Russians and Chinese were there. The US chair was empty. And for me, it answers some of the questions that we've been talking about, that the US is absent. And, and the problems that I see in the world have a lot to do with US absence. And again, Munich was one of the examples. Uh, we were not absent. We just didn't in any way relate to what was going on. There, there so. were 50 members of Congress. 50, well, and part of the reason that they were there was because they wanted to show Article 1 of the Constitution is about the powers of Congress. And it was very deliberate. But on Saudi Arabia, I think our relationship with Saudi Arabia has been unbelievably complicated, beginning with Franklin Roosevelt making uh, an agreement with King Saud at the time. And we do need to have some kind of a relationship with Saudi Arabia. They are a power. Um, I do think that it has to be one in which we pursue the issue of the Khashoggi murder. I think it's absolutely essential. And what has happened, members of Congress have actually um, called for some kind of action on it um, and pursuing it. But I would not be for cutting off relations with Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't think that our relationship can be one that is only transactional in terms of, of buying and selling weapons. Uh, but I do think that we need to pursue the question, which is outrageous in terms of what happened, um, and at the same time, try to have some kind of a relationship with the Saudis. The hardest part about statecraft, and it's come up in a number of questions, is you have to deal with countries you disagree with, whether it's the Russians or the Chinese or whatever. And I find the hardest part when I teach is how to explain that 
um, that sometimes we are inconsistent in terms of the countries that we deal with while we talk about value system, but we need to have that relationship. I wish that we'd never cut relations off with Iran. Your question about Iran. We don't know what's going on. We don't have relations with North Korea. I, until recently, was the highest level sitting official to go to North Korea, to Pyongyang. We had no embassy there. We had no idea what was going on. And so I don't think it suits a country to cut off relations with, a, with another country because of some action they took, but we have to pursue the investigation of it. It's, it's, it's just a question whether the current talks between the US and North Korea is going to be a win-win or a Kim-win, as well, some people say. No, but I have to say, I was asked about Singapore. Singapore was definitely a Kim-win um, because President Trump gave up our exercises with the South Koreans and Japanese without getting anything for it. Um, I have no idea what is really happening at this point, though I read in the papers today that in fact the, the North Koreans have re-energized, uh, literally, um, some kind of their missile uh, factories. By the way, I don't know how many times they've said that they are um, ending what's going on at Yongbyon. I mean, they, they have promised that many times. Um, and I don't know where this is going, but I do think that Singapore was a Kim win, and I think that he expected something like that in this next meeting. Um, and um, we don't, I, I don't know beyond that what happened. Yeah. Thank you for that. The final question, the lady, yeah, by the, by the window. Hello, uh, I am Noor from Palestine. Uh, thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is um, in the framework of um, Camp David Accords that was brokered uh, between the Professor Pshinsky uh, and uh, between um, Israel and Egypt. Uh, do you think it was successful as long as there is no peace between uh, Israel and Palestine? How can a peace agreement be successful bet sorry, between um, uh, Egypt and Israel uh, be successful? And do you think the recently held uh, Warsaw summit that was brokered between Poland and the US is going to do um, anything um, right between the, Israel, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians? Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Well, let me just say, I think that one of the aspects of uh, diplomatic negotiations and agreements is whether you have to solve everything before you can solve anything. And I think this goes a little bit to are there talks or not talks at the moment, or was it a mistake to only do a piece of Iran with the JCPOA? You have to do what you can, and I think that the Camp David Accords that um, President Carter and Brzezinski were involved in with Egypt have been su successful. I think, frankly, kept an awful lot of uh, peace between Israel and Egypt um, and issues to do in the Sinai, very important. It doesn't mean that one has to, that it means that, that it undercut the Palestinian issue. You have to solve one thing at a time. What has undercut the Palestinian issue is the current behavior, I think, where we have cut off our ties with the Palestinians. And by the way, I have to tell you this. Uh, I have uh, been somebody that's been very involved with democratic politics my whole life. Um, the United States has been supportive of Israel, um, and President Truman is the one who recognized Israel. I think the issue, when I was Secretary of State, I went uh, to Jerusalem and I gave a speech to a, a lot of high school students there and then I went to Ramallah and I gave a speech to high school students there and one of the students asked me what is my future and I couldn't answer the question and so I deliberately made a point of trying to sort out legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. I am for a two-state solution and it has to happen but we don't stop trying to make peace with the other parts of um, the mess in the Middle East. That's a diplomatic term of art. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. My, my final and tough question, Madam Secretary, is about your brooch today. Yeah. Your pin. Does it have a specific meaning as you used to wear very yes. specific pins? Uh, well, can I say how it all started, this whole thing? 
What? Yeah, yeah, less than half an hour. Less please. than half. No, but very quickly, what happened is I clearly like jewelry, and I got to the United Nations, and I was an instructed ambassador at um, right after the end of the Gulf War. The ceasefire had been translated into a series of, re of sanctions resolutions, and my job was to make sure they stayed on. So every day I said something terrible about Saddam Hussein, which he deserved. He'd invaded Kuwait. So all of a sudden, there was a, um, um, art, a poem in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, but among them an unparalleled serpent. So I had a snake pin, and I started wearing it whenever uh, we talked about uh, Iraq. And then I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out, and I bought a lot of costume jewelry. So on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. And on bad days, I wore a lot of spiders and carnivorous animals. <laughs> and the other ambassadors would say, what are we going to do today? And I'd say, read my pin. So that, that is how it started. But this pin is, a, is the globe. Um, with an American eagle on top, because I really do believe that America... That the eagle should be on the top. No, that the eagle should be there and not flying away somewhere um, and deciding that it has nothing to do with what the world looks like. I am very proud to be an American and a very grateful American uh, because I'm a naturalized citizen. And one of the things that I love to do more than anything is to give people their naturalization certificates. So the first time I did it was on July 4th, 2000 at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home. I figured since I had his job, I could do that. So uh, all of a sudden, I hear this man go away, and he said, can you believe it? I am an immigrant, and I uh, just got my naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State. And so I went up to him, and I said, can you believe that an immigrant immigrant is Secretary of State. And that is what I believe about America, and I don't think we are behaving away anymore. And so I want to see the eagle and the world together. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you very much. Thank you.